Ray Allen Canine. It's no secret that we love Ray Allen Canine equipment. We use their products every single day at both Van Ness Canine and at Torchlight. Their mission statement says it all to be the world leader in quality innovation for professional canine equipment for police, military, Schutzen, and ring sport. Tend to exceed their customers' expectations and deliver on time every time at a fair price. We full heartedly believe that they've held true to that since it is our go to one stop shop for everything canine, not just police dogs, but for any working dog. This episode is also brought to you by our good friends over at Dogtra, dogtra.com. It's the e collars that Ted and I use. It's the e collars most police dog guys use. Dogtra.com, e collars, bark collars, ball launchers, one stop shop for everything you need for your working dog, dogtra.com. One of the other sponsors we're proud to have is Hits Canine Training Conference. It's the premier Amer- it's the premier canine training seminar in the United States, packed to the rim with the world's best instructors, covering important topics from admins to liability to detection work, all and tracking and everything in between. There's no better place to learn and no better place to network with other handlers, breeders, and trainers. Hits 2022 is being held in Orlando in August, uh, so hit them up. HitsK9.net. We're super happy to be uh, represented by our good friends at Kinetic Dog Food. Uh, we've got great reviews from people all over the place. Uh, ever since we, we joined up with them and partnered with them, their uh, commitment to your dog's nutrition is top-notch. KineticDogFood.com. Check them out. Jim over at NC Canine out in North Carolina. It's the culmination of 13 years of experience in handling the training uh, law enforcement canines. They use real world deployments to develop their training program and run eye not only on their experience, but the current experience of the nation's canine handlers provide the best canine partner you can get. They provide pet training and police canine training based out of Four Oaks, North Carolina, and they serve the surrounding areas as well as nationally. Feel free to call them and learn more about their dog training program, and police canine techniques and methodologies. We got a brand new sponsor, man, American Aluminum Accessories. Uh, my entire time in canine and ever since I've been involved in the dogs, the kennel in the back of our cruisers has always been American aluminum. Uh, check them out. Uh, we're so happy to have them on here. Easy rider online.com easy rider online.com for everything you need from American aluminum accessories. Speaking of kennels, once you get out of the car, you got to have somewhere to put them. So our friends up in Ohio at horizon structures, make a one-stop shop for kennel. If you want a two dog kennel, or if you want a, 20 dog kennel they got you covered they get those things built and they drop it off at your house all you gotta have is a pad electricity and water and you can put dogs in it that day horizon structures can build you anything from mild to wild and it is the one-stop shop and you don't have to swing a single hammer so hit them up horizonstructures.com okay working dog radio broadcasting the bite i am uh, ted summers from tulsa oklahoma um with me as always from canton ohio is eric stambro Uh, eric what's up uh, plugging away, got some dogs in the kennel. Uh, not many left though for, like I've said before, I'm taking September and October off as far as dogs in the kennel. I'll still be training with some dudes, but, uh, I just don't want to pick up poop and feed dogs for a couple months, take a little break. Um, funny thing though, is, you know, I live at a lake yeah. and, uh, I used to do a lot of wakeboarding here and I haven't done it in a while. I probably got, um, seven or eight legit concussions from wakeboarding um well, before, you, already, you already have a fucking head injury from yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm a mess. so so before i started wearing a helmet for wakeboarding i was getting i was trying stupid i would just send it right i'm just coming in whap, trying to flip right. smashing all over the place um the water is not very forgiving but so mm-hmm. october 31st i'm flying down to orlando and for a week i'm doing a wakeboard camp and uh where i'm gonna try to flip i'm gonna learn some tricks and do some flipping Shit. um if <laughs> so. that's if i land it, if i can if i can come back here i'd be as far as i know the oldest guy on the lake that can flip of wakeboard so that's what I'm and going for those for. not listening like i've been to eric's house a couple times like and it's not like there's like 10 people on the lake like seven thousand people yeah. live on the <laughs> lake i mean it is there is a bunch of people there there's yeah, more boats than good- cars good borders here yeah but they're all yeah. top out in their 40s the the oldest ones so it'd be pretty cool if i could do that um i hope i don't break my ankles or tear an acl or something like that but yeah what are you gonna do so yeah. I, I can't just cruise around on the boat anymore dude i gotta i gotta get out of here and do it right so i used to be able to fly 
on the board. And I just lost it. I lost my mojo. So I had to get it back. What's going on there with you? It's still hot. Uh, they installed my air conditioner the other day and they're putting ducting in and the air conditioner guys are in. And uh, one of those stupid pointer puppies I have were out. Run one of them was out running her. I just let her out and she's running around. And um, I had some explosive odor out that I'm working her on. And she runs over and does her indication on her little pipe. Like she's down on the pipe and the air conditioner guys are like, the hell's wrong with this dog? And I was like, Oh, you know, this is what she does. This is what she does. It's no big deal. And apparently she comes out of the kennel and I just let her run around and she comes over on to uh, the explosive odor and downs and does her indication and they're, they're trying to pet her and she's doing she's bobbing and weaving and like don't touch her don't touch her don't touch her and i'm just kind of watching i'm like ah, you know it's you know and because i'm cleaning her kennels that's why she's out and cause she's already worked that day and uh it, I, my interns are sitting there like should we reward her i'm like yeah because she's an indirect reward i'm like yeah just grab a handful of food and just say the magic word from across the kennel and they were like yes and she would run <laughs> 20 meters from the reward all the way to restore the food and then all the way back to odor and then all the way back to restore the food and then all the way back to odor i was like all right your kennel's clean you can put her up <laughs> she's already yeah, worked she's today, exhausted so. yeah i was like she's fine and no she sat there and barked all for 20 minutes uh so that and uh we had what interesting happened oh we got a <laughs> We got a wiener dog that is part of a pack that hunts and uh, bites people. So that's fun. Uh, I call him the murder weenie. He's uh, he's not that bad. He's uh, he's a cool dog, uh, Mr. Leon. But other than that, you know, it's pets. And uh, I'm going down to a regional training day this weekend. Taking, or, well, Friday. Taking my interns down to regional training day. Guys from North Texas and Oklahoma, Southern Oklahoma. Uh, Southern Central Oklahoma. So that'll be fun for all the police canine stuff other than that it's uh ssdd lots of reps on place and here <laughs> and uh so other than that not a lot so uh but what do we got going on tonight so tonight's pretty cool man um we all of the military handlers and people involved in the military side that we've had on are all uh gwat guys you know um guys right, that right. handled the you know because we've been there so long guys have been handling dogs and over in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and different places like that. Um, but we wanted to have our guest on. Um, he is, we're going all the way back to the Vietnam era for, for our guests. And this yeah. is pretty, it's going to be pretty cool because I'm fascinated by all that, that time. Well, we've so, had several people ask about this oh, specific yeah, for sure. era, right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. And I'm like, it's kind of that unknown. Like, well, well you know, and I, I wasn't born then. So, I mean, I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> so, let me look. Yeah. I, I was born uh, part of the time he was in the Marine there Corps, you go. so we're good. So. My dad, my dad, this is his era. Um, but anyways, um, so those of you on YouTube, that's why I have glasses on, because I'm going to read his bio on my phone here. Um, he served in the Marine Corps uh, from 64 to 70. We all know that's uh, right in the meat of the Vietnam era. Um, he was assigned to the 1st Marine Scout Dog Platoon. Um, he and his dog Stormy, one of the first 30 Marine scout dog teams to be deployed in the Vietnam in early 66. Um, in 2000, uh, our guest and a few other uh, Marines and Vietnam era guys started the, um, let me make sure I pronounce it just right, uh, United States War Dog Association. He was a president from 2000 to 2021, so a long time. Um, it's a really cool organization. And if you look at this, when, when this comes up on YouTube, you can see a ton of things in the background behind him in his office and all the memorabilia. And they have been helping um, military working dog teams ever since they kicked it off, sending care packages, sending letters, sending support, help, um, all kinds of great things like that. Um, they, they do that through their Operation Military Care Canine. The program is amazing and it's definitely something that's well needed and um people that i have talked to um from the military working dog world said that it's very well respected and um appreciated like really appreciated that type of stuff so uh without further ado the uh 
chairman of the board of the United States War Dog Association, uh, Ron Aiello. Ron, how are you, buddy? I'm great. It's good to be here. Good, good. Glad you could uh, get in. So real quick, what is all that stuff behind you? This forces everybody to go to YouTube, by the way, when I say this stuff. Uh, what's behind? Well, what you see behind me on the, my left side, that's kind of a wall of memory or honor. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, men and women who uh, were killed in action over in the Middle East. And on the side wall are all the dogs that were killed in the Middle East. And, uh, well, we have photos all over of the different oh, dog teams yeah. that have been serving uh, in Vietnam, uh, Korea, World War One, uh, one dog from World War, yeah, one dog from World War One, which was a uh, Sergeant Stubby. Oh yeah. And it's kind of like a little museum here. Yeah. Uh, we try to teach people about military dogs, what they've done in the past, and what they're doing today. Um, so that's why I have it all set up like a museum, so I could teach people about military dogs and their handlers. Yeah, it looks uh, a lot of people still don't know that we have military dogs. <laughs> I don't know where they're living under a rock. Of yeah, some I know, sort, but... I know, I know. So before we get into your background and everything, like we usually do, uh, let's talk about something we were talking about before we started recording. Yeah, <laughs> this is kind of like a one of those things that comes up because of the moment um today is august 30th um when this airs it'll be september 13th 13th ish. i think yeah so um the people listening to this are well aware of the um what's going on half a world away and the august 31st deadline um there is a picture floating around and it's a bunch of a crates in front of a a and a helicopter um and i have been working dogs all day pets and police dogs and dealing with my interns and everything else and so uh there, there's a like a misconception that there's a lot of um military working dogs left over there I, i've been in contact with some contract guys that, and girls females that got out several weeks ago and they did not leave any military like in no mwds npcs or combat assault dogs were left by the u.s military i know we left a lot of other shit there which is not outside the scope of this conversation uh but they were not left there the dogs were not left there so the picture um i, I when somebody sent it to me i was like if that's part of the ana thing like those may have been dogs left by the ana like i get it I can see that, but those are not U.S. or they are not contract dogs, right? So, Ron, what's your? You have been in contact with some people that you're that had some very like people are super worried. I'll put it that way. Uh, I contacted. Uh, well, actually, he called me uh, Rich Farkas. He was uh, at the the DoD. He was actually uh, in charge of all the military dogs for all branches of the military. He retired just this past year. Right. And he gave a call over there to the DOD about the dogs. And he was assured that all the dogs, military dogs, were out of Afghanistan. And I believe the contracting dogs actually left first about two weeks ago. So I've seen these photos. I've had people calling me up about uh, there, there's military dogs left behind there's 70 of their 70 of them and they need money to bring them back and the one lady last week uh, she said i've already raised eleven thousand dollars and i told her you know give the money back uh then a person from the akc called me and she had the, she got the same story and she was ready to donate ten thousand dollars and i said please don't do it because the dogs are not there they are all back what you're seeing are stray dogs that rescue groups, there, there are several rescue groups in Afghanistan yeah. that have been rescuing these dogs. And that's the dogs that you're seeing photos of. The rescue dogs. They're not military dogs and they are not contracting working dogs. Yeah, that's it's that's very good to hear that. it's very yeah. deceiving. Right. No, it's oh, super that's deceiving. a surprise. Something deceiving <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> no, 
You're right. Yeah. So, I, and I, my initial comments were like, we should be a little more worried about getting um, people that aren't there or that are there that don't want to be there <laughs> out rather than, and I, and I knew that all the, the dogs came home. Um, I know um, I, I was been in contact with a couple of handlers, handlers that were over there um and they're like oh hell no and on top of that i i they had like some kind of golden retriever looking thing it's like what is that and he was like oh it's a rescue this is kind of wandered onto the airfield i'm like what are you doing they're like oh we're gonna bring him home I'm like what okay <laughs> they're like we're gonna put his ass on a plane i'm like all right all right fine they're like we're gonna stick him on the back of one of these c-130s or whatever whatever's coming out of here and he's gonna fly out with everybody else and i said oh okay fine but i know that and they had um uh how can I say this? They had uh, the dogs there to help kind of screen and do whatever and some other things and um, to get people kind of go through to, to get on to flights and get out and whatever else. So um, I, I didn't have any doubt that they were going to bring those dogs home. <laughs> There's no way. And if for no other reason, then they're still considered U.S. like property. But then we left a bunch of other shit there so i'm not like i was like well they're not gonna you know and i i just don't but so i got a ton of messages the last two days i woke up to an inbox full i'm like oh fuck I, people are asking me and i'm like i don't know the answer to this like what do, who do i ask so i ask a couple of dudes and they're like no they're that's not it's all contract all the contracts in the military dogs and cwds mpcs mwds combat assault dogs are all out or have left or were not left yeah it's, it's like rescues and like i said if it was a dogs it wouldn't surprise me would um there was another middle east country that had kind of a similar problem and you know but by and large they're they're out so for everybody that's seen that photo there are no hell there may be dogs cats there. in some of those crates well i mean we got a bunch of dogs here so like worry about them <laughs> like yeah, we're we don't even worry about we don't even worry about dogs in afghanistan <laughs> not that huh. aren't ours so but anyway so cool there we go yes there we All go right, ron so let's let's talk about your background a little bit where are you from where'd you grow up uh well, i grew up in trenton new jersey mm-hmm. i can tell i can hear that <laughs> uh, there's some Tren trenton <laughs> folks are going i know yeah, right. boom got it so uh did you join the uh, marine corps right out of high school or uh, about, a, about a year after high school, I joined. I was 19. Uh, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I wanted to be a Marine since I was probably eight years old. Uh, my uh, grandfather was a Marine in World War I. My uncle was a Marine in uh, Korea. Uh, and I felt that I should f follow suit. And so first opportunity I had, I uh, joined the Marine Corps in uh, July 64. Uh, went through basic training, ended up in uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And uh, I guess it was uh, late 65 that they were asking for volunteers to go to dog training school. And at completion of the dog training school will be assigned to a restricted area. And I thought, well, you know, Vietnam was starting to build up. And what better way to go to Vietnam than with a dog by my side? So uh, I volunteered and uh, went to Fort Benning, Georgia for three months training. Uh, there were 30 of us and we trained for three months and then they put us on two C-130 planes and flew us right over there. Um, we were over there in about, about four days later. So we went from Georgia with the cold weather to uh, Vietnam. <laughs> that was quite different, hot. Yeah. yeah, it was quite hot. So we had to acclimatize the dogs for about 20 days yeah, I bet. before we were able to actually be able to use them. Uh, once we acclimatized them, then the, the word went out to the Marine Corps that 1st Marine Scout Dog Platoon was ready to be deployed. And uh, I happened to be one of the first to go out on a mission. And it wasn't because I was any better than the other teams. It was because they went alphabetically. You know, ILO. <laughs> Yeah, with an A, yeah. and the other person was Brent with a B. <laughs> Sucks to be Brent. So oh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, what? Um, so the, the army top. was doing the training then? That was, or did the Marines have their own the school? Army, at the army, the, army did, the Marine Corps didn't have a training program, so they asked the army to, to train us. So uh, we went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I, I got—I hate to say it, but I'm going to say it, the army did, army did a hell of a job training us. 
they were really good, the instructors. So we went, when we went over to Vietnam, we had a lot of confidence because of the training and because of the bond we already formed with our dogs. And uh, we were very successful over there. Uh, after six months, we were credited the 30 dog teams with uh, 2,200 kills and captures. Damn. Yeah. And, oh, and that's not even counting all the ammunition and the weapons that we found. So oh. the dogs were magnificent. What were they using? <laughs> what? Hold on a second. Mm. What were you using the dogs for when you guys got over there? Well, we were scout dogs. We used them for everything. Uh, enemy ambushes booby traps, punji pits, trip wires, uh, sentry if we needed it. Uh, we would go out in front of the patrol. Uh, if we were in the thick jungle, maybe we were only a few yards ahead. If we were in the clearing, the rice paddies, maybe we were 50 yards ahead. And we were, our dogs were first line of defense, early detection. So uh, if my dog alerted, my dog would automatically stop and kind of point and look in the direction where she's getting the scent. I would automatically kneel down by her side and, and talk to her, ask her, what do you see, girl? What do you see, Stormy? And try to decipher what she's trying to tell me, which it could be, uh, you know, at 11 o'clock, 300 yards, a possible enemy am ambush or a, uh, a landmine or a booby trap up, up the, tr the road a little ways. Uh, matter of fact, my first patrol... Uh, had to uh, search two villages, search the first one, which I would go into the house with Stormy. She would sniff around. If there was nothing there, we would come out, and then I would tell the Marines behind me, all clear, so they could go into that house and move things, open drawers, and not worry about some explosive going off. Mm -hmm. So we went through the whole village, nothing. So I'm leading the platoon uh behind me uh down a trail and i just come out into a clearing stormy eye we took about two steps she stopped and she looked up to the right flank well as i said when she alerts you go you kneel down by her side so i started to kneel down and as i started to kneel down the sniper's bullet went right over my head Ooh. and missed me so she picked up the sniper in the tree could have been, I, I doubt she smelled them. It was probably some kind of sound that shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, it could be a rifle and safety being taken off. It could be a twig breaking, but she alerted to it. And it was enough for me to, to realize she's alerting to some kind of danger. So that was my first patrol. So I knew <laughs> definitely <laughs> well oh, she was going to work with shit. me. So tell us about Stormy. Like, what kind of dog was she? German Shepherd. Uh, when I met her at uh, Fort Benning, she was 18 months old, young. She was a baby yet. Yeah. Uh, we trained for three months. Um, we started with basic obedience, advanced basic obedience, which was hand commands, nonverbal commands. Uh, and then that was up close. Then we did it like 30 feet away. And uh, once, once we they felt that we had control of the dog. Then we started to scout, train as scouts. And what we do is we set up a, a patrol, fake patrol. Mm -hmm. Send one of the Marines out earlier and hide hide out in the woods. And then we'd set up a, a, a fake squad patrol and we would lead, lead the patrol. And you, you knew that the, the, the Marine or decoy was out on the left flank side because that's where the wind was coming from. And, and, if the dog passed, went too far and wasn't picking anything up, the person out there, the decoy, maybe break a, a twig, make a little bit of noise to get her attention. And once she got her attention, then you would praise your dog. Good girl, good girl, Stormy, and pet her and praise her. And then, then the person would jump up the decoy and start running and make noise and then chase after him. It's like a game. So now the next time you're running that patrol, your dog's kind of looking for something because they know they're going to get praised. <laughs> they're going to get mm -hmm. to run after this idiot. Uh, and eventually the dog starts sniffing and listening for everything in front. 
and it, it just automatically they would smell the scent of the that that decoy out there uh, in a field, hiding in a field. But they loved to praise. They loved to have praise, uh, and and that's what it was a game to them. What would so I always like to ask this because we've gotten guys that were early GWAT, late Syria, different deployments. What uh, explosives were you guys finding from the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese? What were they using there? Uh, I mean, we were finding from hand grenades. Uh, a lot of it was uh, our own uh, munitions. You know, 155 mortar didn't go off. They would get it and, and fix it so it could go off. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, we had two men that were killed by 155, one of our own. They set it up in the doorway of a house. And uh, the two uh, two dog handlers walked in. They didn't have their dogs with them. Uh, it was raining, so they tied their dogs up and went in. They were going to go look at a map. And the first one set off the, the tripwire uh, and killed both of them. Um, if they had their dogs with them, their dogs would have alerted on it. So it was you know, kind of a mistake. I it's, a, said. it's a crazy, like, parallel. So, like, you take from from vietnam fast forward to semi present day one of our recent guests uh was a green beret handler or i'm assigned to a task force in syria and he talked about tripwires and talked about a lot of the things he talked about except the tripwires were infrared they weren't normal like right. wires like you dealt with and they dealt with um HME and so it wasn't normal explosive um it was stuff made out of spray paint it was shit made out of stuff that they could find the one thing that was interesting about like the guys from Iraq that we talked to versus the guys that go to Afghanistan and Syria and all these other places is that the Iraqis had and like the dudes in Iraq had stuff that was normal conventional explosives that were stolen or low from uh, the American whoever and you go to Afghanistan and despite the fact that the Russians left but the, most of it was um, HME and so we would train these dogs and you train these handlers and you have these trainers that were like oh I were I was in you know wherever and doing anything else and they come to these areas and they come to these um, AOs and they're like uh you know this is not what we train for this is not the normal thing that we and we've talked to a couple handlers that found um new odor or not necessarily new odor but just stuff that wasn't planned on when they were training in the united states and they're like oh shit we have to do some training in the field and do some exposure and do some either uh like proofing off or you know like confirmation training in the field for new odor for stuff that guys are using in and we had paul hammond on like way back i mean he's back in the 20 I and mean, we're in this, this episode like one 40 something yeah yeah so when we had paul hammond on uh and paul the a ninja with that kind of stuff and he was like you know you need to talk about the stuff and deal with the stuff that you guys had on uh that you're dealing with like in your ao and you know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for people in the united states train on dynamite because the one thing the atf has managed to do well is keep real explosives out of the hands of people that don't need it but that doesn't stop the regular shit from or like the hme stuff from getting into people's hands and it was kind of was dealing with with they were dealing with in iraq so it's it's interesting just to hear to hear that you guys dealt with the same problems that our guys were dealing with in you know 2013 14 in syria or even later than that and in afghanistan they're dealing with trip wires they're dealing with uh but the explosive material was different so it's definitely a regionally which is why eric asked the question it's like it's definitely a regionally um specific thing and dealing with uh you know like the people that you're they're planning ieds or planning tripwires or planning bombs or planning anything else to deal with so um when you guys trained those dogs at fort benning how i mean it's been and like as like we talked about earlier like i this is before i was born a lot of this stuff happened before i was born so when you guys did that stuff how was the training for the explosive voter was it direct reward indirect reward how did that go uh, again, that was, uh, you know, it was uh, hidden in the ground. Uh, could be you go into a building, you may have it in a wall. You know, it could be explosive, it could be ammunition, 
could be a rifle. They pick up the rifle oil scent, right? Human human scent. When we first got over there, I don't think they could really distinguish the difference in smell between a, a, an American and a Vietnamese. Two different scents. Mm -hmm. But eventually, they started to distinguish the difference between the two. So if you had you had an American a Marines over to the right flank, and you had a Viet Cong up ahead, they're going to pick up the scent of the Viet Cong and not associate the American scent. They could actually distinguish the difference between the two. I'll give you an example. I'm searching a village, and I just finished searching one building house. I'm going over to the next one. Uh, it's probably there about maybe uh, 50 feet between the two. As I'm walking, I'm about halfway over to the other house. Stormy stops and looks to the left flank. Now, the only thing there in the background is some tall grass. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe somebody's in the tall grass. So the way we worked, because we only had a 45 sidearm, uh, and the reason we only had a 45 was we were yeah. the first. They didn't know whether we could handle a rifle and a dog. Holy shit. So what I would do is have a bodyguard to my, my right rear. He would have full automatic rifle and 14, and he would be my, my bodyguard. So I said to him, I got an alert. You, you want to go in on it? And he says, yeah. So we went in. Went into that clearing, and all of a sudden, Stormy stops, and she looks straight into the ground. And I'm going, booby trap, landmine, you know? So my bodyguard pulls out his bayonet, and he starts moving the grass, the, the leaves and the dirt and everything. And he's moving it. He's down six inches into the ground. He's down a foot into the ground. Then he's down 18 inches into the ground. No booby trap, but he reaches in there. He pulls out a plastic bag. And in the plastic bag are documents. So we, we turned the documents in. We found out the next day that they were North Vietnam, um, uh, the soldiers of North Vietnam. It was their battle plan. Oh, wow. She, what, she, what she picked up, and it's 18 inches in the ground, oh, is yeah. her, the human scent that was on that plastic bag. 100. percent That. Yeah, I got. I got to be. I got to be honest. There was also something else in that bag, and nobody's going to do anything after all these years. There was two diamonds in there. Oh, uh, oh, God. He looks at me. He says, "Yeah, two diamonds. There's two of us." I says, "Okay." Yeah, uh, there you go. So we uh, took the diamond. When I got back to base camp, I sold it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but it, she picked up on the human scent on that bag. That's you know, down in the ground. I'm real. I, I couldn't believe it myself. Yeah, that's. Uh, we had another. We had a ranger battalion, a ranger guy, on uh, one of my good friends, Trent, um, on. And when he was on, I think the episode's called like High Six on our Tritronics. But they talked about dealing with some of the dudes in Afghanistan and. Like one of the dog, both of his dogs, uh, Benno and Leica, had problems dealing with the AA guys. And um, he's like, Man, and it was only in the dark. And he was like, I, you know what? I, I know what the problem is. And he had him come back because they shared some like space and whatever else. And he's like, You know what? Come back. I'm going to wash your clothes in our like in our stuff like we're gonna wash it in tide pods basically like don't eat them like but so they washed their clothes and like after that benno and Leica had no problem dealing with um <laughs> like the dudes that were assigned to those teams and he was like oh you smell like these you smell like our guys but no yeah. you're 100 yeah you're 100 percent right <laughs> like uh, i don't know about finding diamonds but now the, um, yeah now the other thing uh we used to do and i don't think the army did it um uh, uh, we lead night patrols to ambush sites. Yeah. In other words, uh, one example is uh, uh, Intel said there was a vehicle going through a certain area by an old cemetery, a few clicks out. So when it got dark, uh, we moved out, and uh, my friend Mike Obrander and his dog Candy, they were leading the patrol. I was pulling up the rear, and then we switched off. 
and, and I was leading, uh, and it was kind of a, you ever watched the Benny Hill show? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole night was like a Benny Hill show. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we go and then, then the, the wind changed. So I took the left flank and then I walked into something and was, and then my bodyguard sh sh had sh lit a, a flashlight. I walked into a spider web. And the spider web was right by my left hand, by my head. And I jumped back so fast, I think I pissed my pants almost. Because I hate spiders. Mm, uh... So then we go down and we make a right flank. We got to go down the ravine up the other side. And it's muddy. And I'm slipping and I'm sliding. And Stormy's up there already you know, on my six-foot leash. So I told her to stay. And I was kind of hoping she could help me up a little bit. Finally got up. And once we got up, we realized we lost one of the Marines that was pulling up the rear. <clears throat> so the, the wind changed again, and we put one of the Marines out front. And now, now we're at, at about 10 o'clock at night, 10.30 at night, and all of a sudden you hear, halt, who goes there? And I said, holy shit, we're going to get killed. Yeah. It must, it, this Marine must have just got off the boat. What had happened is he walked out into the clearing at the same time a Viet Cong walked out into the clearing from the other side. And they looked at each other. And all the Marine could think was Hong who goes there. Well, he shot the Viet Cong. Luckily, the Viet Cong had a, uh, a rifle with the wrong ammunition. So it wouldn't fire. Nice. <laughs> so we got out, got out to the ambush site, set up and everything. We were there several hours. Nothing happened. So we led, led the patrol back, and we found the Marine we lost. What had happened, he stopped to take a piss. And when he looked up, we weren't there. And the reason was we made a right flank and went down that ravine and up the other side. So he hit, he hit in the bushes <laughs> until we came back. Heck yeah, man. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a hilarious night. Uh, and there were other nights like that. I mean, nothing happened. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't always that you had combat. Yeah. So when you guys get there, when you when you uh, your um, scout dog unit gets over there, did they blow you guys all over the country? You're going with this group. You're going with that group. Or did you just get hoard out constantly with whoever wanted or how did how the requisition work for you guys? They, well, it was only 30 of, 30 of us for all of the Marine Corps, I Corps. <clears throat> and so we couldn't do long missions with, you know, for days and days with different with the same unit. So we bounced it with maybe a one day, two days, three days mission. Uh, they just say, uh, you're going out to 3-5, be ready tomorrow morning, you know, at, at 0600. Chopper's coming in. Chopper come in, you jump on with your dog, and they fly you out to wherever it was. And most of the time, we didn't even know where it was. You know, we just flew out to their unit. We didn't know where their unit really was. Right, and we worked with them, lead patrols, uh, and then get phone back either to to our home base in Denang or to another unit. Now, after we were there about six months or so, we had another thirty dog teams come over. So now we have sixty dog teams. So now we're able to do three week three week commitments with the same unit. Uh, it was just that we were. Not enough dog teams for all of the Marine right. Corps. Of course not. No. And was word starting to spread, I assume? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, that word was, was spreading, uh, you know, uh, with all the units. They wanted us. They kept asking for us. The dogs, uh, we had a bounty on our head, and the dog had a bounty on our head. Uh, we, we were worth, the, the handler was worth about $10,000, and the dog was worth about twenty. To kill the dog, kill the dog, they get twenty thousand dollars. If they, they had to prove they killed the dog, how uh, the hell they do and that? And the reason was they, they were trying to get rid of the dogs because they were doing so well over there. Yeah. Yeah. What happened is one of the reasons they wanted scout dogs because they were getting ambushed so much. They were walking into ambushes. Well, once the scout dogs came over. And we're leading these patrols. They weren't getting ambushed anymore because the dogs were alerting to the to the the ambush. So when you were saying earlier that 
that some of the things the dogs would find are those like uh, punji pits. Yeah. What What are they? The, is it the disturbed earth, the dug up ground, or is it them, think, them touching the? What were they finding? Well, touching it, but they used to. What they used to do is they they you pour urine on it. Ah. Oh. So if, oh. if you did get a punji pit in, in in your leg or your foot, it's going to get infected right away. Because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to take you out yeah. of commission. So the dog dog would pick up whatever they put on that punji pit. Usually it was like urine. It could be feces, for all we knew. Uh, but the dog would smell it when they got up to it. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so all the stuff that I've ever seen, read, heard, anything about from Vietnam era soldiers is how much pro how many problems they spent the humans their entire tour there fighting foot problems what were some of the health problems you had to deal with with stormy on a pretty regular basis uh, insects leeches leeches oh. was a big, big issue you know in monsoon season uh, one case oh. where I'm uh, leading a patrol in the monsoon season, we're going through tall grass and everything, and Stormy started to kind of like moan a little bit. So I stopped the patrol and I looked down, and she had on her, her chest, she had a number of leeches on her, and they were bleeding. Gross. So I pulled the poncho over us, lit a cigarette, and I burned, trying to burn them off. And she, she kept bleeding. So I said to the the, the platoon leader, the lieutenant, I says, I need a medevac out of here for her. I got to get her back to the vet. Of course, he wasn't too crazy about that. But he knew that if I asked for a medevac for her, he had to do it. Yeah. They were told that. So they brought the medevac in, flew us back to base camp. Uh, our veterinarian was waiting for the chopper to come in. He took her, took her right to the, the vet house, and he performed surgery on her. He had to cut out those areas. They were getting infected already. Uh, foot problems, uh, you know, cuts, scrapes, um, cuts going, you know, through certain areas, sharp, sharp bushes, or so forth like that. As far as uh, any other health issue at that time, there were none. They were pretty how, good. How big are the leeches that you had to deal with? They were probably about three inches, three and a half inches long. They were nice sized ones. <laughs> no spiders, but you'll take leeches all day. Fuck right? that. No, I'm I'm yeah. both. I'm, I'm I, I have a, a <laughs> friend of mine here and that lives in the little town that I live in, who was uh one of those um Mac V Sog guys, and he got shot nine different times over there. And he said the uh the worst wounds he ever had were he got shot and then the leeches got into the bullet wounds before. Yeah, I heard that myself. And it's just horrible. He said, it, he said that damn near got him out of the military. It was so bad The the gunshots were of course what they were, but he said the leeches were the worst part. So stormy uh, did the whole tour with you. Yeah. It's not too much tour. And um, when it was time to leave, uh, uh, when we were over about nine months, they started to train another 30 Marines at Fort Benning with training dogs. Mm -hmm. And then they were just going to fly over and relieve us. Uh, it was probably six or seven of us. We wanted to extend for another tour uh, as dog handlers, and they wouldn't let us because uh, we had 30 replacements coming over, and that would mean six or seven of those handlers wouldn't have a dog. So yeah. they said, no, you can't. You, you can extend it as a, a Marine grunt, but not as a dog handler. And we said, no. I said, I'd be glad to do another tour with no problems as long as I'm with my dog. Uh, so so we didn't stay. So I met, I met the handler. Uh, they gave us a day notice, let us know the handler was coming in the next day. Handlers came in. I met the handler who was taking over Stormy, sat down with them for a couple hours, and then shook his hand and said, Good luck, because he only was going to have about two weeks, maybe three weeks tops to learn everything about Stormy and then start to go out on patrols. See, I had three months of training with Stormy. Right. 
right. before oh. going out on patrols. And so your first we had, patrol. <laughs> we had the advantage. Yeah, yeah you get thrown and, the deep and, end of the pool yeah. on your first, first deployment. And that's why I shook his hand and wished him good luck. <laughs> you know, uh, but they did good. I, uh, I met each handler that she had after I left. I have met them. And she was, uh, I met them, the last one was 1971, and she was still over there leading patrols, finding explosives. So she, I was very proud of her. She was doing a good job, saving lives. Um, that's a lot of work, man. That's, that's a lot of work for that dog. Um, so when you came... I the point before, after you're done. When you're over there, um, was so the first thirty dogs that went over there were they? Was it all German shepherds or were they using uh, mixed German shepherds? They were mixed. I mean, we had one that had Great Dane in it. We had a one who had some Eskimo in it. Yeah, they were. These dogs were all donated mm. to the oh. military. These were all yeah. somebody's pets at one time. Yeah, that was. And Stormy, I believe, was uh, from Indiana originally. And I did probably, write the, the family. Probably, we wrote back and forth for a while. She's probably from Bond Lake. Yeah. He, went, <laughs> he was in the in then. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All one right, of, cool. One of the advantages we had versus the, the dog teams over in the Middle East, our explosives that we had to deal with were not remote controlled. Right. Yeah. They didn't have no, yeah. Them. So that, that was an advantage for us, a disadvantage for the dog teams over in the Middle East because they could they could set it off when you're almost up to it. So real quick, when you would when she would alert, point, what how how what were you using to make your determination on whether it was a human uh or whatever? Because you gotta make that quick. Make yeah, the determination is when I get down and try to decipher what she's saying, I have to look at the terrain out front. I have to feel the wind, what direction it's coming from, how it's coming. Usually we want it the wind between, uh, say, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, preferably. Okay, so we can really get the scent in the air. But then we have to look also out front. What was the terrain? Was the, was the tree line, you know, a certain way? Could the scent have been coming around the other side of the tree line and we're picking it up? So you had to you had to look at all of that to make that decision. Yeah, that's like uh doing math and shit right there in the middle of the field and hoping that no bullets but, I mean, come. And I, yeah. I think that's one of the most important parts is when you get down and you're you're trying to decipher your dog, that's kind of a life and death situation. You gotta kind of call it right. Because if you call it wrong. Uh, somebody might get killed oh for sure for sure yeah um well, all right we're gonna go ahead and this is pretty cool we're gonna go ahead and take our first break when we come back we'll uh yep. see what uh post vietnam was like and and how we ended up getting into the association so stick around we will be right back we have a long-standing relationship with the guys over at hits canine training conference uh it's truly america's premier canine seminar it is the largest it is the best um, they cover every important topic in the canine industry, hundreds and hundreds of vendors, thousands of canine people there. Everybody you know in this industry is there. Ted and I will be teaching. Hits 2022 is being held in Orlando, Florida, August 16th to the 19th. Also, check out their website, hitscanine.net. They have other classes that they're putting out online, uh, Zoom classes and all kinds of other things. They're offering in-person classes leading up to Hits 2022. Orlando, Florida, August 16th through the 19th. Check it out, hitsk9.net. Everyone knows me, knows that I live on chicken nuggets and Coors Light. So uh, that doesn't mean your dog should, though. Um, our friends at Kinetic um, are make it a, a point to fuel working dogs, and they know that it can be tough, and they need high-quality food, unlike me, to give them energy and the nutrients that they require. I just subsist on air and you know Coors Light, which, but the dogs can't. They actually have to work. So for that, we asked... Kinetic and Kinetic has come up with a great balance of healthy meats and grains and is made specifically for working and sport dogs. They have a full line of foods and supplements available, and they've been working to perfect their line for thousands of dogs and hundreds of departments across the U.S. 
You can buy it locally online or at Tractor Supply, or you can get it at Chewy. So head over to their website, kineticdogfood.com, 513-615-6904. And get them on the socials at Kinetic Dog Food. So probably the number one product I've ever advertised for or used that set, that does what they say is Quick Derm by Vet Care. Uh, I have it uh, at my house. I have it at the kennel. I have it at the fun house. I have it at the uh, doggy daycare. I have my trainers have it at their house. It is unbelievable how it works. You guys have all heard Ted and I talk about it, how we've gotten tagged by dogs or dogs do, you know, if you're dealing with working dogs, weird stuff happens, right? It's cuts that, how the hell that happened? Bites, scratches, all kinds of things that happen, especially if you're doing anything in the wooded area, they get tore up. Uh, the Quick Derm by Vet Care. It is no exaggeration. It is great. So once daily treatment for any skin condition or small wounds to help stop little issues from becoming big ones. Comes in sprays, ointments, or dressing. Quick Derm is great at creating a protective barrier and promoting wound healing. The best thing, too, is they have a discount code. Get on their website, vetcare.us. That's vetcare.us. Put in the discount code 10 WDR in capital letters, one zero WDR for 10% off your first order. These next guys uh, have actually been on the show and we instructed at uh, the first uh, tripwire conference down in Florida. Uh, Jim O'Brien was a guest on the show uh, and he runs NCK9, who has now come onto the show as a sponsor. Um, Jim's been around for quite a long time, about 13 ish years. Uh, with experience handling and training law enforcement canines. Um, he uses real world deployments to develop training program and not rely only on their experience, but current experiences from most of their national canine teams and handlers to provide the best canine partner that you guys can, can purchase. They provide pet training and police canine services based out of Four Oaks, North Carolina, and they serve the surrounding areas. Feel free to give Jim a call, a text, carrier pigeon, however you want to get a hold of him. Uh, to, to talk to him about police canine training or pets and techniques and methodologies. So hit him up at 919-438-0141 or J O'Brien. That's J O B R I E N at N C letter K number nine dot U S check the show notes. We'll put it there. All right, everybody. We are back working dog radio broadcasting the bite. With uh, Ron Aiello from the Vietnam era, uh, talking about his dog Stormy and some, I'm sure there's, you could probably tell stories all night, but uh, it was pretty insane. Um, <laughs> sounds like fucking... there wasn't a lot of downtime. <laughs> fucking your... hairy, there's some hairy <laughs> shit going on over uh, there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look back on it, you know, you, well, when I was there, you know, it was a job and you didn't think too much about it, but looking back on it, I, I must have been a little crazy. Yeah, I'm like itchy. I can like feel the bugs and the leeches while you're telling those stories. Uh, yeah, it's a whole that's a whole nother door and the spider webs and things like that. So uh, Stormy stays with the next with the next handler. Um, you rotate back. Where did what happened to you after that? <laughs> that's interesting. Hmm. There's 42 Marines in our unit. 30 of us are dog handlers. 41 of them got stationed close to home. The 42nd one, which is me, got sent to Key West, Florida. And I live in New Jersey. <laughs> it wasn't close to home. Not at all. Not no. at all. And then I finally figured out when I enlisted, I enlisted in Miami. <laughs> so they just looked at where I enlisted and figured Key West, Florida, which was a good uh, thing. I love Key West, Florida. Not bad. Uh, U.S. Not... Stable Base, Marine Barracks. Was there a, a year and a half before? I, yeah, year and a half there. Uh, Marine, Marine, uh, you know, security for the base. Uh, it was good duty. Uh, met my wife down there. She was working for civil service. And we got married down there. And uh, moved to New Jersey after I did get out of the military. Did you have trouble coming down after such a high operational pace? Oh, yeah. Did I? I think, I think most of us did. Well, first of all, you you don't have the real Marine Corps structure when you're in, in a combat zone. You can do a lot of the stuff that you normally couldn't do in the States. Uh, so getting back, 
I had that attitude, which, which I had to get rid of mm -hmm. uh, and get back to being a straight Marine again. So I, I had some, some problems a little bit uh, with our commanding officer at Marine Barracks, but we straightened that out, got that straightened out. Uh, yeah, and then I got, I guess for about 10 years after I got out, I bounced around from job to job. I just, I couldn't stay in one place. Yeah. I, you know, if I stayed a year, it was a year too much for me. Uh, you know, I moved back to Florida, moved back to New Jersey, moved back to Florida, went to California, moved back to Florida, you know, and I did that for almost 10 years and my wife put up with me. Uh, so it took 10 years for me to actually settle down. And then I still had to deal with my PTSD. Yeah. Did they even understand that back then? No. No. no I, I had gone to the VA when we, we had moved up here. I went to Philadelphia. They didn't understand anything. I just stopped going to them. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't go to the VA until, God, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, I had a good friend from Vietnam. He kept saying, you got to go to VA. It's changed a lot. And, I, and he kept pushing me, and I finally said, all right, I'll go. I made an appointment. Went to, It was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, and I have to say, they were terrific. And I still go to them, and they're, they're still terrific. Uh, they take care of me. Surprisingly, you know, because you hear so many bad things about the VA, and a lot of them are probably true, but I have not had that bad experience with them. Um. When you were moving, bounce, bouncing back and forth to Florida, was that during the winter? Were you like, screw this, I can't take another one of these winters, you go to Florida? It, it, it didn't make any difference no. weather-wise, season-wise. Because every single winter here in Ohio, I, I'm like, I need to get the hell out of here. I just I just would just get to the point where I, I said, I tell Judy, I said, we got to go. We have to move. And I'd say, <laughs> let's, let's go back to New Jersey. Let's go back to Florida. And she'd say, okay. You know, and, and we would just, I mean, we'd sell everything and go. So after that 10 years, when you settled down, did you kind of focus in on one kind of uh, career path there at that point? Uh, Occupation-wise, yes. I mean? Yeah, I, I'd always been working for somebody, and I just couldn't get along, you know. And so uh, I had worked one year with my uncle when I first got out of the military. He was an auctioneer. And I worked with him... Uh, setting up the auction, buying, buying the merchandise and everything. I did that for a year. And, and then I was in the food and beverage business for a number of years, restaurants and, and bars. And I was never satisfied. I always wanted to do something with my hands. Uh, so for one year, I did work in Trenton at a dental clinic to be a dental technician. So I, that, that taught me how to make things, you know, create things. Mm -hmm. So uh, my uncle, who I was not working for anymore, came over to me and he asked me if I could fix this bowl from a bowl and pitcher set. I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So I went out, I bought some supplies and I restored it, put it back together, made it, did some painting and everything came out pretty good. And I said, wow, maybe this is something I could do. So I practiced and practiced and bought more materials. And I did that for about six months. And then I got my own business, Antique Restorations, restoring China, porcelain for dealers, museums. Did it for 32 years. And that's, yeah, when, I, I, that's when I settled down. That's amazing. That's, Actually, that's this, really neat. This, this war dog office here was my dental... <laughs> my antique restorations at one time for 32 years <laughs> and about seven. And I always did for the last 21 years, I, I started doing it part-time U S war dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that became starting to become like almost a full-time job. So about seven years ago, I decided to shut down my business and just concentrate totally uh, on the military dogs. That's awesome. So let's talk about that real quick. Yeah. How does this, how does this, you and these other guys, what, is this a, a bar time conversation? How does no, this get going? No, no, what happened is I got an email from a, a, a gentleman who was a dog handler in the Middle East during Vietnam, and he was going to be at the Philadelphia dog show. 
and he had he was have, going to have a, an exhibit, War Dog exhibit, and he says, why don't you come out and stop by? So I did. And he, of course, she sent emails out to other dog handlers up in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. And so we did a couple of dog shows with this guy. And then we, there were four other dog handlers. Uh, one was an Army Scout dog handler. The other three was a uh, Sentry Dog, Air Force. Excuse me. And um, we said, maybe we could do this, put an exhibit together. So we did. And we started to go to dog shows and dog events, just telling people about what the dogs in Vietnam did for us. And it, it really went over well. It was received very well from the, the pub, general public. So then we decided, you know, why don't we start fundraising and uh, create the first state war dog memorial in the country? So we picked the uh, New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial up in Homedale, New Jersey uh, for the site, and we got permission from them. And then we started the fundraise for it. It took six years. We raised the, the funds for six years. And then in uh, June of 2006, we dedicated the, the first state war dog memorial. In the meantime, 2003, they start to send troops over to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I just remember when we were over in Vietnam, we didn't have any support. We didn't get care packages. We didn't get letters from strangers. Yeah, you know, I got I got my grandmother sent stuff over, you know, yeah. family members. So I asked the other uh, board members, I said, uh, you ever get a care package from somebody you didn't know? And they said, no, we never have. I said, well, we're going to make sure that these dog teams that are over in the Middle East get packages and realize and understand that there are people back here who care about them. So we started the, the Operation Military Care Canine. And we started care packages. And I think over, that was 2003, uh, we probably sent well over 30,000 care packages uh, to different dog teams. Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, you know, a number of satellite countries around Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and they appreciated it. Uh, it was a great program. Uh, and we were all really happy to be able to help them. Uh, did a lot of email and back and forth talking, you know, uh, asking how they're doing, what they're doing, you know, and if they could tell us what they're doing, they would, you know, mm -hmm. if they couldn't, we understood. <clears throat> and uh, it was very fulfilling to be able to help them. What, what are in those care packages? Uh, we, 70% are for the dog and 30% for the handler. We'll put, we'll put toothpaste and toothbrush for the dog and we'll put a toothpaste and toothbrush for the handler. We'll put dog treats in there and we'll put snacks for the handler. Uh, goggles for the dog's eyes, boots for their paws and like hot sand and asphalt, ear wash, eye wash, uh, anything that would help the dog work better. Cooling, if they needed a cooling vest, we'll send a cooling vest over to them or a cooling bandana that both the dog or the handler could wear to keep them cool. Because in the summertime, you want that dog to be able to work, able to work as close as possible to 100%. Because if they right. can't work well, they may miss an alert. And, and that's, we don't want that to happen to them. So, I mean, we put, and then sometimes we'll, we'll I'll email the handler and say, what do you need? What actually do you need? And put that care package together by their needs. That, that's pretty cool. What, um, did you partner with any, any like manufacturers or anybody to get like the dog? Well, a lot of, a lot of the companies, uh, you know, Doggles and, and Mutlap companies, they, they gave us a discount like we were a dealer. So we had like a 40% discount. Now we had, uh, in 2010, I had a phone call from uh, Pet Value Pet Stores. They're up in the Northeast region. Well, they were, they're out of business now. Uh, and they called me and they said, we like what you're doing. We'd like to help do a fundraise. I said, fine, you know, and they said, well, we'll get back to you. You know, and I've heard that before, we'll get back to you. But they did, yeah. two, two weeks later, they called me and said, we got, got it all set up. We're gonna do a fundraiser. 
from July 4th to Labor Day. I said, terrific. So they did, they, they sold paw prints and bandanas and they raised us about 26,000. Wow. But then the following year, it, it more than doubled. And at some point, about seven years into it, they raised a half million dollars for us. Jeez. Yeah, I know, I know. But unfortunately, they went out of business this year. They had 358 stores, but they lost so much money because of the pandemic. They shut all the stores down. Yeah, I remember that. That's that. That's definitely one of the um, crappy byproducts of that whole entire thing. Yeah, so now they had a sister store down south, Pet Supermarket. They didn't close it down. They sold it off. But that... The new owners are still doing a fundraiser at least for the month of July. So they're raising yeah. us a couple of thousand. Oh, that's nice. That's really yeah, nice. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. So do you have do you have like people that reached out to you, hey, my brother is deployed right now with his dog? Is that how you kind of find out about who's who or it's it's word of mouth, yeah. It's a word of mouth and, and I'll get uh, you know, I'll get a, an email saying my husband's over in Iraq. Uh with his dog, you know, and uh, can you support him? I'd say, sure, just give me his name and his address and we'll get a package right out to him. Yeah. You know, uh, so, you know, um, could be mothers, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives that, that will contact us and, and just want to help their family members. And we're, we jump right on it. We love it. Oh, yeah, of course. All right, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. Uh, we come back. We'll talk about where we're headed. Um, and some of the memorial things and um, talking to Ron. Uh, this has been this is pretty great. So stick around, guys. We'll be right back. All right, guys, this episode has been brought to you by great sponsors of ours. Please don't skip through this. Take a listen to them. One of our oldest sponsors and great friends of ours are the people down at Highland Canine down in North Carolina. Um, I really like them. We have we see them at all the conferences. I know a lot of people have been to their school for dog trainers. They've been on the podcast, Highland Canine. They're a full service canine and pet dog training business where they can train you to be a trainer. They can get you a dog. They have handler classes. They have supervisor classes. They have trainers courses for just LE. They have them for anybody who wants to be in uh, in the dog business, be a dog trainer of any kind. Um, check them out. Their website is tacticalpolicecaninetraining.com, tacticalpolicecaninetraining.com. If you are smart, you'll go down there in the winter. It is North Carolina. It is warm. You get to work dogs. It's no, no joke school, guys. You're not going down there for a month um, and, and rushing through it. They're actually trying to make you real deal dog trainers. Uh, TacticalPoliceK9Training.com. Next is a sponsor that's been with us for quite a while, uh, Dogtra. I love Dogtra stuff, and they continually keep bringing out new products. Uh, one of the things that I've been using a lot lately is the new Tone Box. If you're a pet trainer... Or if you train a lot of police officers, and I harp at my guys all the time about timing, and this thing literally kind of pairs to the to the remote, and when you're using the remote, whether you're using Nick constant or vibrate, it makes a noise, so you can get the timing down 100% consistent. And so I can demonstrate how to do an out with an e-collar immediately, quickly, and it is so effective that I can't believe that it took me forever to figure it out <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to get that. They've also got these new um, comfort feather like titanium things that go on the collars that uh, are fantastic for making sure we got contact. It actually has six points and this comes in two sizes and it's a titanium feather thing. They're awesome. They got comfort, comfort contact points for the bark collars, the YS 600. One of my favorite things. I have about 50 of them at the kennel and it is dead silent. And I put them on all the pet dogs and I can leave them on because they have the comfort contact points and they're fantastic. All this stuff you can get at dogtrid.com. And if you use the discount code WDR, one zero you get 10 percent off a single item over 200 bucks so that covers the ball trainer that covers the 1900 ask hands free which is my personal favorite for all the big dogs uh it covers the two dog system uh the 202c which i use for the two dog pet guys and fantastic so dogtra.com or go to at dogtra official on all the socials that's facebook instagram all those places so hit them up dogtra.com guys i don't even shop any other sites when i'm looking for everything for dogs our one-stop shop for anything pet dog training and police dog training hunt dog training anything you need you can find at rayallen.com they have been doing it forever we have a great relationship with them 
Um, again, they're at all the conferences. You can stop up and talk to them. They have more stuff there than any place. RayAllen.com. They are amazing. We have a great, uh, really, really good relationship with those guys. Um, like I said, I get on their website. I do not look anywhere else. I just get on Ray Allen. Why, why should I fill up my cart, pay it? Boom. Shipping. Here we go. Uh, everything's coming rayallen.com. And guess what? We do have a discount code for them. Working dog radio for 10% off. It's all one working dog radio and it's all caps. Check them out. Rayallen.com. I'm not too shaped to admit that I used our own discount code to buy stuff for the kennel. We have American aluminum next. They're a new sponsor for, uh, moving forward. Um, they have been around for quite a while. They manufacture a wide variety of products from the high quality cam lockers and toolboxes to a huge line of products designed to meet the ever-changing needs of law enforcement community. Back in 1992, due to the demand for safe, secure transport for a nearby law enforcement department's canine, they introduced the very first Easy Rider canine. They have continuously grown and expanded products, catering to the needs and wants of the valued customers and high-profile clientele. Over the years, as the needs have changed, they have evolved and expanded their products to include inmate transport systems, canine training aids, canine inserts, contraband, containment, and animal control systems, just to name a couple of things. So you can find them at easyrideronline.com. That is easy echo zulu rider online.com. You can find them on the socials at American Aluminum Accessories, and then you can hit them up toll free. 1-800-277-0869. You don't have to worry about writing all that down. We're going to put it in the show notes. So just scroll down to the bottom, write it down, click the link, take you straight there out into your phone. Our first sponsor we ever had, he's been, he's our ride or die. He's been with us since the beginning is Arno over at ALM K9 Equipment. His stuff is so good. Ted, you know, gets suits. He, and listen, Ted's suit, he's had it for a long time. Arno's fixed it. He's uh, taken a million bites on it. It still holds up. The thing's amazing. I've got a suit from him. I love it. Use it all the time. Uh, but the main thing that I really love about Arno is his hidden sleeves are ridiculously amazing. They are the best. And his tugs. I usually buy tugs from Arno by the box load. He'll send me a whole bunch of them. I hand them out to the handlers, new handlers when they come in, experienced handlers. Uh, they last for a long time. They're amazing. The craft work is is great. Arno's doing all the, the sewing there. He's got pre-made suits. He can do custom-made suits, everything you need um, out there. And he's out there in sunny Las Vegas. Get on his website, check him out, almk9equipment.com, almk9equipment.com. Discount code WD Radio, all caps, 10% off your first order. Check him out. All right, everybody, we're back. Working Dog Radio broadcasting the bite. Ron Aiello from the um, Vietnam era with Stormy we had some great stories here talking about the uh, the uh, United States War Dog Association that's um, supporting guys all over the world out there working dogs. So those of you who are watching on YouTube are wonder will wonder who is that in the background. That's that yeah. um, dog well, I'm statue. The, I'm pointing at the screen like people can see me. But yeah, like over. Go to YouTube right. and see what <laughs> yeah. I'm pointing. I'm at. like, what's that? <laughs> So There's the dog, dog is behind you. That uh, statue you have. Who is that? Oh, that that was created by Susan Bahari out of San Francisco. That if anybody watched the movie Max mm -hmm. that came out about two years ago, there's a scene where the young brother is riding his bicycle up to the Marine base, and in front of the Marine base is this tall pillar with a dog on top of it, and the Marine Corps flag. And American flag are flying, and that's the dog that was up there. They asked her if they could use it for a prop, uh, and she gracefully uh, gave it to me. <laughs> she called me up. She said, "I'd like to give it to you." And I says, "Sure." Yeah. <laughs> so it's a beautiful dog. Oh yeah. And anybody who knows anything about these types of statues, uh, they are not cheap. They're not cheap for the artist to make, and they are not no. cheap for you to buy. You got one at the clubhouse. Yeah. Uh, so you got a we had a, one at the clubhouse, fucking Jethro. Like, yeah, you got a we Jethro. Had, yeah. We had a dog, Jethro, that got killed, and we had a, a an artist named Lena Torich make a um, bronze statue of him, and it's on this amazing base for the Police Canine Association. I, I'm going to say we've got like 30K into that thing. Um, it's expensive. Oh, it's yeah. there forever, though, yeah. too. Yeah. So. 
Describe, talk to us about the memorial there that you guys have in, in New Jersey. It's a dog and a handler, and uh, the, the dog is at full alert, and the handler is kneeling down by his side with his right arm over the dog, and that's what I would have done. And, and uh, kind of saying, what do you see, girl? Ah. It's, it's a little larger than life size. And I wanted that with the dog and the handler in that position because that's, that's the most important part of scouting is deciphering what that dog is trying to tell you. And uh, Bruce Lindsay from New Jersey created, he did a fantastic job for us. Uh, his, he really got into it because his brother was a Vietnam vet. Nice. Is the handler wearing a Vietnam era? It has uh, a Vietnam era uh, gear, would have been the yeah. gear that I wore uh, out on patrol. Um, I'm going to back up real quick. And Ted yeah. and I ask this all the time. Yeah. So what gear were you like? Oh. Were you a 30 foot leash guy? Were you a 10, five, six, six. 50? Six foot. We're, we're not allowed to work off leash, and we're not allowed to work with a thirty foot. You had to be six foot leash all the time, never all, off leash. And what that really did was at night on the night patrol, that made a difference because when Stormy, I told, I put the harness on Stormy and, and snap on that leash, and I tell her search girl, she would go out front. She'd almost be pulling my arm out of my socket. Oh yeah. If she alerted. The leash went slack because she stopped. So if I couldn't quite see her real clear, I could feel her and know that she alerted. And you could be right there, like All right. depending on six where the wind away. is, she could be damn near standing <laughs> on the dude. Yeah, I mean, fucking you, six you feet know, away. I hope you had some moon up there to give you some light. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But that's how I was able to tell her she alerted at night. Is the, Man. The, the, it would, the leash would slack on her, on me. With this, with this fucking COVID shit, like being six feet away from people, <laughs> I, I am, I'm all about being more than six feet away from people. Believe me that. So, <laughs> like running a dog on a six foot leash, other than walking and maybe some like narcotics work, I'm like, nah, they can get out in front of me. It's good. <laughs> yeah yeah man I not allowed to be off leash i run a 50 foot line during tracking with fucking green dogs i'm like no get out in front of me go on i'll be behind you i'm, I'm let me catch up bro but running a six foot line tracking no i'm good <laughs> I'm like nope <laughs> especially if the dog especially you're saying those dogs had a like they were getting rewarded for killing them i don't want to be anywhere near them <laughs> like <laughs> and then if you're the handler i don't want to be near where you either so, like, if I was with you, I'd be like, no. Nah, with his 45, his 45 yeah. pistol. They give you a fucking gun. They give you a handgun. They give you a handgun and a six-foot line, and you're like, oh, by the way, you're both targets. And in the front. I was in your, yeah, and I would be like, no, nah, she needs a 45 at least. And if I was in your patrol, I'd be like, you, you need 100. I'm going to put 100 on you. You put a 45 on the dog, and we'll be good. <laughs> Fuck yeah, you heard him say sometimes he's nope. 50 yards away in front. 50 nope. yards. Yeah. <laughs> I would check out sometimes a shotgun, take out Talk with the, that. yeah, you know, uh, that's nuts, man. Action, just in case. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you, want me, we, you want me to do what? <laughs> yeah. So with the memorials, have you guys? Um, put memorials anywhere else have you helped oh, uh, build just, some for other people just last year we put some put someone very special arlington national cemetery nice at the woman's memorial at arlington it's the gateway to arlington uh-huh. and we were able, susan Beharry, who did the, the statue behind me uh created a memorial specifically for female dog handlers oh wow oh, that's we cool. commissioned her to do it it's a dog and a handler. It's called the Pledge. You can look it up and see the photo. It's beautiful. And we put that in last year. Uh, even though there was a pandemic, it was open that we could bring so many people in and uh, had a real good turnout. And uh, so that that was an important memorial to put in. Yeah. Uh, we worked uh, with uh, the Women's Memorial there at Arlington for a year and a half. 
to get it approved. Uh, and uh, we dedicated it last year. Uh, and there, there's other memorials. We didn't do it ourselves, but we made donations to them to help along. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. I tell everybody, you know, it's those people who are in like the uh, western part of the country that don't come this way very often um, are really missing out not getting to Arlington to see. I've been there a few times. Um, yeah, I've been there twice. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. I remember I ran the Marine Corps Marathon and we run through Arlington and I'm running with a pacer and we're running. I'm reading these things as we run by them. Oh. And next thing I know, the pacers way up there because I'm damn near walking. I'm just and, it, and it's yeah. every time I've been there, it's blowing away. But now I'm going to have to go back just to see the pledge there. Yeah, you yeah. definitely have to see it. That's that's pretty it's, amazing. It's, it's well, I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, war dog memorials in the country. Yeah. What? Um, so unrelated to dogs, how powerful for you is the Vietnam Memorial that they have there? In DC? Yeah. Um, I've been to it a couple times. The only reason it really I get emotional is because two of my friends are on there on that yeah. wall. The two guys from the uh, the, the two guys 55. from my unit, yeah, Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, when I when I found out about it, it was kind of a shock because uh, I had just come back from from a mission, mm -hmm. put Stormy up in the kennel, took care of her and everything, and I was walking back to my tent, walking around to the front of it, and somebody said to me. Holton Shepard are dead. And I, I just kind of froze in place. And I, I, it, it, I still remember it. Brian just sent me a picture of uh, the Pledge Memorial. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that thing is gorgeous. Yeah. Is that, that thing is amazing, man. Very touching, very powerful. One it of is. my, uh, one of the guys that's local here is a Marine handler um he wow. his name's anthony marquez and oh, we're trying to nail him down to come on uh he's doing a, a video project um he's got some other stuff going on great dude but there there was a, a thing rolling around um i don't have to look at it but it had to do with some gwat guys um that were killed and you know there was missing information and there was some like inaccuracies and in some of the stuff that they had and like so he went through the the museum or like the the project it's like a traveling deal right and uh so when you said like it you know you saw two of your friends there and like he had guys that he he lost uh 17 guys on one deployment um they were in Sangin and it was a super hard summer for those dudes and uh you know it's an interesting to hear you talk about these memorials whether it's the war dog memorial the vietnam memorial or the memorial that um uh, my buddy was talking about that like they move it around the country and how they correct some of the issues i've heard about misspellings of people's names on the on the vietnam memorial and um so and i you know i've seen the picture I, of the pledge of the pledge and it, it is definitely like a super super nice like it's it's a beautiful uh, memorial and it's I, it wasn't there last time I was there, um, which was a long time ago, uh, like when I was in college. Which I mean, I know we're talking about Vietnam, but it's still like <laughs> twenty something years ago. So it's been longer than that. So if you're around, you should go see everybody stop by that one. But um, you spend all day at Arlington. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, oh, I yeah, you been, can. yeah, I've I've been there. It's we we yeah. got we got about ten years ago. We got an opportunity to take four retired military dogs to Arlington hmm. and walk around with them because uh, uh, I I think that you know they're not crazy about bringing dogs in there. Yeah. Uh, but they allowed us, and we walked around with the dogs, uh, and it was wow, so powerful to be there and look at all those names all right. and all those yeah. those sites uh so what's the future of the united states war dog association well, what do you well, think we're doing 
what happens is, you know, when a, when a dog, military dog retires, they retire because they're either old or they're sick or both. Mm-hmm. And they're on a number of prescription drugs. And, and the military just cuts them off from everything. They don't get any support. So it's up to the person who adopts the dog to pay for everything. So uh, a woman had called me up, uh, must be six, seven years ago. And she said, we adopted a military dog a year ago. I love, I love my dog, but I'm at a point where do I put food on the table or do I buy prescription drugs? And I says, well, you, you need to do both. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right. So, so the next day uh, I sat down and started thinking about it and, and pet value pet stores, you know, were bringing in a lot of money for us. And I said, okay, let's start a free prescription drug program for military, retired military dogs. So as of today, we have over 1,100 dogs on the program. Holy Damn. smokes. Yeah. Holy that, shit. Definitely <laughs> holy smokes. So then, then, uh, <clears throat> I had a woman call me again that from McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. Her husband's a dog handler. Uh, he has a new dog, and he's deployed, and they have the retired dog, but the dog's really at a point where it needs to be put down, euthanized. It's, it's in too much pain and all. So she asked if we had a program to help her with that. And I said, you know, not really, but have the veterinary call me, and I'll pay for it. So again, I sat down. I said, "Wait a minute. Let's have an end of life program, Operation uh, Rainbow Bridge. So we pay so much for the, the euthanization, uh, or the euthanization, and so much for the cremation. We reimburse them for it. We we supply wheelchairs when they can't use their hindquarters. Wow. Uh, and we have uh, Red Bank Veterinary Hospitals here in New Jersey. There's five of them." <clears throat> As long as they're registered with us, we can get them in the hospital for anything for free. Surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, dental work, whatever. So it's all free. So we have all these programs for retired military dogs. <clears throat> I've stepped down now as president. And Chris Willingham, a Marine uh, who served 20 years in the Marine Corps, 17 years uh, out of the 20 in the dog field dog handler, kennel master, and uh, I've known him for probably about 10 years, and he came down to the best choice to take over the organization. So I asked him about two years ago if he would do it, and he said he was honored to do it. So Chris now has been president now since January 1. Nice. Uh, yeah, Chris we, is we, actually... We the Marine. What's that? Yeah, Chris is actually, um, after this one, after this interview, Chris is actually our next interview. Okay, so, great. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, so, he's a great yeah. guy. He's a perfect <laughs> guy. Uh, very dedicated. Uh, so he's he is uh, leading U.S. War Dogs Association now. Uh, I, I I'm chairman, but I'm kind of in the background, letting him do everything. Yeah. You know, he he's learning everything and starting to run everything now. He's doing a great job. And I feel confident, you know, 20 years from now, he'll still be running it. So if people want to help you guys, where's the best? Through the website or through yeah, they social could media? To, they could go to our website, uh, uswardogs.org. And there's donation uh, buttons on, on the pages that they can make a donation directly to U.S. War Dogs. Uh, if they, uh, you know, they could call if they need any information, they call Chris, they call myself. Uh, we'll be glad to talk to them and tell them exactly where the money would be going. Because we have it set up that they could designate where they want the money to go. They don't want to care packages, do it, uh, health care, and the life services, you know, and, and that's where it would go. That's, that's impressive, man. You guys are doing so much. 1,100 dogs in the... In yeah, the, uh, med yeah, just program. on the prescription program. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, I was like, there are healthcare providers that don't do that with people. So <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm mean, just saying. But <laughs> hey, what, Bob Thompson is a co-founder of the organization. When I started out, I, I say to Bob last year or two years ago, I said, Bob, you know, I thought, you know, 
we'd put the dogs on a program, some would die, we'd put more dogs on a program, some would die. It's not balancing it out. He says, he says, of course it's not. That's why we're giving them medical care, so they can live longer. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, Eric, where... Well, Go ahead. Yeah. We actually are giving them a year to two years more in life with the medication and treatment that they're getting. Oh, so without a doubt. We're, we're, we're prolonging oh, yeah. their life. Oh, without a doubt. So they can eat more, more beef jerky and sit on the couch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is where they should be. So, um, Eric, where, uh, where can we find you? Um, I'm, you can find me at Van SK on an Instagram. It's the best place. Working dog radio. We have our own Instagram page, working underscore dog, underscore radio, working dog radio on Facebook, Patreon. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So Ron, do you guys have social media? Well, we have the we have face we have Facebook pages, mm-hmm. uh, uswardogs.org. We got two different groups. We got a group and a page. Uh, they can go over to that, and they can Check find out. out a lot about what's going on in the world uh, with military dogs. I'm it's just the United States War Dogs Association on Facebook. Yep, I'm looking up right now. I'm joining the group. Well, there's questions to answer, so I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of dog handlers post on it of their 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 dogs or, or stories about their dogs. So there's a lot of information on the site, on the yeah, Facebook I, site. I just followed it. So yeah, that's yeah. that's good. How about you, Ted? Where can you be found? Uh, Ted underscore Summers on Instagram. Uh, that's my day to day, like pets and uh, police dogs. Uh, and then Torchlight Pets, and then Torchlight Canine, letter K number nine, and then HRD Police Canine. Uh, and then obviously working underscore dog underscore radio for the podcast, uh, which is where we have all the stuff, which will be a post about this interview here up probably already by the time this gets done for everybody before it's even done editing. So yeah, other than that, and then obviously you mentioned Patreon. So yeah, um, Ron, this has been great, man. I mean, we we've had multiple people were like, "Oh, you need to have somebody on for Vietnam." I'm like, "Well, shit, we got to find one of those guys first. So, like, we found one. So, uh, you know, and it's interesting because you know a lot of the things that you talked about that the dogs are used for, they're used now and for the same things, and you guys have the same problems and the same issues. Aside from the six, the you're, foot, you're right. The, you know, you go back and talk to six foot the, leash. I've done. I I know a number of dog handlers from World War II. The war dogs, the South Devil Dogs in South Pacific, and I've I, I've gone to a reunion with them, and their stories are exactly our stories, and our stories, yeah. their stories. It it it's the same thing. The only difference is different time and different location. Yep. We do the same thing. Uh, and while, while this interview is going on, one of my buddies that's a ranger handler that was a GWAC guy, I'm texting him and I'm like, oh, we got a Vietnam guy on. And I was like, you guys are saying the same fucking thing, <laughs> except you're 40 something years apart. And he's like, right. uh. exactly. and he's like, well, so he's texting me. He's like, what do you mean? And I tell him, he's like, well, no. It, so he and I, he, he, and, we're going and, back and forth. I'm like, no, it's the same thing. I promise. I so, started this. I was in my 50s. When I started the organization, right, and I was dealing with in 2003. I'm talking about 19 year olds, 25 year olds handlers, and yeah. we we could relate to each other so much because I know what they do, they're doing, and they know what I have already done. So we have that that bond between 100. percent Yeah, there's a bond between us. We un, we we can understand each other. So it makes no difference what your age is. One hundred percent. That's correct, so, man. Well, thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, oh, it's really my pleasure. Your time. Yeah. I mean, I love to talk about the dogs. I mean, that's what it's all about. Right, I'm gonna so, go ahead and mute my mic because uh, Jesse's barking, and you're just gonna hear me yell at her. <laughs> Shut up! Like a crazy. So person, you know, yeah, Ron. Thanks for coming on, and for those listening. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. The guy you just mentioned, Chris Willingham. Chris is on. I'm got an interview with him in two days. So that episode, this episode uploads on the 23rd. So for the or for the 13th, for those listening, 
the Chris Willingham episode uploads on the 23rd. So we're talking to him day after tomorrow. So yeah, but Ron, uh, I appreciate it, man. I thanks a lot for coming on and My it's pleasure. Been a great interview. Yep. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, guys.